Holy God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want to talk about prayer today. Some would say, some commentators would say that the book of Ephesians that was just read for you is a prayer book. And that section, the magnum opus, the middle part of the book of Ephesians, is Paul's prayer, not only for, I'm going to say, the church in Ephesus, but also his prayer for the entire church down through the ages. That we would experience the love and peace and joy of God. That the Spirit would come upon us and that we would know this powerful God of love. I don't know about you, but I have found oftentimes that we in the modern or postmodern era find that prayer is important, but can often get shoved to the side. I find it interesting, downright ironic, that even my own sermon on prayer was a struggle for me. And it took me quite a while, much longer than is usual, to formulate what God was calling me to say. I wonder if you can relate to my prayer journey. Sometimes prayer is incredibly easy. There are just times when you feel like your life is full of coincidences that are not coincidences, right? They're providences. When I interviewed here at Sandy Lake Presbyterian Church, I had been talking to God a lot because let's be honest, I needed a job. And I remember, I was so clear, I walked out of my interview, out into the parking lot, it was dark, I didn't realize I'd just spent two, two and a half hours with these people, and I literally looked up at the sky and said, really? Sandy Lake? Because I was so convinced that I was called here that you didn't have to offer me the job yet. I knew that I was coming. Before I got that phone call, I believe it was from Jim Ackman, before I got that phone call offering me the job, I knew. I just had spent enough time with God that there was this peace, this consolation. Can I tell you about another time? I felt called to go to seminary, um, and instead of talking to God about it, I started watching an incessant amount of television. When um, I realized that that wouldn't um, work, I had to actually fast from television. And can I tell you? Um, I spent a month spending a lot of time at the library borrowing books and reading incessantly. It took me fasting from television, getting bored of reading, before I finally was willing to have a conversation with God about whether I was called to go to seminary. It was a dry spell, probably because of my own willful disobedience, but it was a dry spell. There are times in my life that it just flows. I come in and sit in this sanctuary and talk and talk, and other days and weeks, I get so busy and distracted that I think, when was the last time I actually sat and was still? <laughs> Prayer, we believe, we proclaim it is important, but oftentimes it gets strangled out, and I want to acknowledge that, because I found in my life that being told that prayer is important and you should make it a priority doesn't actually help me, because I make it a priority for a couple of days, and then something happens. Something gets me off of my rhythm, and it goes away. And then I recommit myself, and I'm here, and I'm praying, whether it's here or on a walk, wherever. Being made to feel guilty, not helpful. I am, I meet with someone called a spiritual director. Um, it is a requirement of my doctoral program. And thank goodness, it was something I would not have done had I not been required to. It's a requirement of my doctoral program, and so I meet monthly with a nun, a Catholic nun 
who has been trained not as a counselor of mental health, but of spiritual health. And she one time asked me when we were talking about how I might um, engage in prayer life in a way that's meaningful because I was in a dry spell. Um, she asked me this question. Your mom, she says, because she's a Catholic nun, she's not. Um, she asks, says, your mom, so tell me this. When one of your children crawls into your lap after a busy week and sits down and wants to tell you about their day, do you say, oh, please, tell me about your day? Or do you say, how dare you? You haven't spent time with me the rest of the week because you've been too busy going to baseball practice and watching television and doing homework. You've been too busy. So how dare you come crawl into my lap and want to spend time with me? That's one of the reasons I read the book about the loving parent to our children. Because ultimately, God is a God of love who loves us and wants us to spend time with God for our own benefit. But Ephesians tells us it goes beyond that. We spend time with God. Our lifeline is prayer to connect with God. And it's so that we may experience the peace and the power, according to Ephesians. The peace and the power. But ultimately, it's not just for us. The NIV, because I don't have the message memorized as much as I love the message translation. The NIV says, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine. To him be the glory, the power, the honor. Amen. And so it is to give us peace. It is to give us the power it is to blow our imaginations out of the water so that we may see what God is up to. But it is also so that God may be glorified. And as busy as our world gets, as distracted as we may be, as hard as prayer may be for some of us, prayer is our lifeline. And I don't want you to feel guilty about because I have spent much of my Protestant, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps life, feeling guilty about my prayer life or my lack of prayer life. I compare myself to the saints in my life and the saints of the church that I have read, and I think, why can't I be like that? And as quick as why can't I be like that can become, well, I'll never be like that, so why bother trying? Comparison is the thief of joy. Right? So I want us, as we explore this idea of prayer, because we're going to be talking about this for a while, because this summer we're going to be exploring what does it mean to be a church that is what's called a sailboat church, a church that is flowing in the spirit and not powering through with our own grit and determination, but in the spirit of God, following God's will for us. And so that starts with prayer, as individuals as well as as a church. And so my challenge for all of us, including me, including me, because I have those seasons where a pastor's not supposed to have trouble praying, but I admit that I do. I want us to playfully experiment with prayer. So if you are someone that has... Uh, um, identifies with those um, dry spells that I talked about, and you have a hard time imagining those, those periods of consolation, those periods of peace where you feel really connected, I want you to put a note on your dashboard of your car or your bathroom mirror or your refrigerator, wherever you go the most, and I want you to play around with just this prayer. Every time you go into that freezer to get that ice cube, brush your teeth, whatever it is, wherever you go to that place, I want you to simply pray, Lord, I want to want to pray. If you are someone that's in that dry spell, that's all you need to do. Every time you go to that place, you start your car, wherever that place is, that has that note, simply pray, I want to want to pray. If you are someone who just naturally prays, we see you as someone who naturally prays, has this gift for prayer, but, but I know now you don't have a gift for prayer. You have been practicing this prayer, this heart of prayer that you do this. 
does not come naturally. You have years, if not decades, of experience of praying. And practice does count, right? For those of you that do not understand what I'm talking about, these dry spells where they are so far in your past that you've kind of forgotten them, a little amnesia, I want you to pray for those who might be struggling. I want you to, when you come into this building, pray for the people who are coming into this building. I want you to, to ask God's spirit to fall, not just on yourself, because we know that the, the spirit is already upon you, but that you pray for those who are struggling, that the spirit of God would be evident in this place and among these people, not for our sake, not for Sandy Lake or glory, but so the kingdom of God would be demonstrated here, that God's love and justice and joy would be evident. Pope Francis says that the church doesn't grow by guilt or rules, but by attraction. May the Spirit continue to fall in this place that people want to know this God that we serve. But for those of you that are somewhere in the middle, the, not the I want to want to pray, but the, not the I got this. Jesus and I are our are, are best friends and we spend all of our time together. I want you to playfully experiment. I want you to try something different. It might be that you lay under the stars or lay on your bed and look up at your ceiling fan. It might be that you sit and open your hands in a posture of openness. For some of us, we need to be still. For some of us, we need to be moving. So go for a walk, go for a drive, do it while you're washing dishes. For some of us, we need to have nature. For some of us, we need to be in the sanctuary. And dare I say, if there's a car out front, come knock on the door if the door's locked. You are welcome here to pray. Some of us need a notepad so that when you get distracted, me, um, you can write down that thing that came to mind and then let it go and come back to prayer. For some of us, we need to journal. And some of us, it's just reading the Bible because Slowly and carefully, it might be a posture, it might be movement or stillness, it might be listening to music or singing music, maybe a little off-key, it's okay. I want us to experiment with prayer. I want us to be people who are drawn into the experience of God, and that happens in and through prayer. And I am not going to pretend that it is easy. And I'm also not going to make you feel guilty if on Sunday you come and you haven't done any of it. We do it not to earn God's love. We do it because God loves us and we want to spend time with God. And so we do it so that we can get more of God, more of God's spirit in our lives. Graham Standish, who is a, um, a pastor and a spiritual director himself, um, writes that he finds that when he is spending time with God, he experiences more of those coincidences that I talked about. So I want you to set aside any expectations that you have about prayer. I want you to set aside any guilt or any rules about what you are supposed to do for prayer. And I want you to playfully experiment. And I I want to tell you that it is okay if there's a kind of prayer that does not work for you. I am really good at reading stories to my kids cuddled up. I'm really not good at sitting and watching movies with them. And so that's not something that I tend to do with them because it doesn't work for me. But get a good book, Harry Potter, right? And I am there. Don't beat yourself up by the ways that don't work. But Playfully experiment to find the ways that do. I'm going to start. This is how. This is how last minute. This is how I. How much I wrestled. I asked Barb this morning at what 9:15. She's going to play a song. She's not going to sing it. It's called Holy Spirit. You are welcome here. So if you want, if you have no other way of praying, you can just simply say those words over and over again. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We're going to spend a couple of minutes. Playfully experimenting. And this is very un Presbyterian. You can open your hands. You can stand up. You can write things down in your bulletin. 
You can do whatever. You can move, right? Very unpresbyterian. I want you to start. Because the only way to start praying is by starting to pray. Thank you, Barb, for your last-minute willingness. Let us pray.